Okay, uh, good evening everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, ICTS Foundation Day uh, program today, beginning with the ICTS Foundation Day lecture, and then uh, followed by the cultural program and uh, dinner. Uh, so as all of you know, every year we celebrate uh, the Foundation Day uh, and uh, we always uh, like to have uh, it as an occasion for the whole community to get together and uh, to begin the celebration. We always have a lecturer who is uh, typically someone uh, uh, who is uh, a, a friend of ICTS in some ways. Uh, we have Herbert, of course, give the talk uh, virtually. We've had Ashok, uh, Jitu Mayer, various people. And today I'm very happy that uh, we have uh, Professor uh, Mahan uh, Maharaj uh, here from GFR Mumbai uh, for this Foundation Day lecture. Uh, so we uh, uh, aim to have this as a talk that would be accessible more broadly, and I'm sure Mahan will do a great job in explaining uh, some of the uh, more deep aspects of geometry and topology to all of us. Um, uh, so let me... Um, introduce Mahan especially. It, it's a, a great, uh, uh, it's a particularly nice for me to introduce him because uh, I think uh, we have known each other for more than 40 years now. I think uh, 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 we were actually in school together in the same class uh, and uh, uh, and then we were in the same college, and then, of course, uh, the Mahan uh, went uh, in, uh, so at IIT Kanpur, and then Mahan went on to do his PhD at Berkeley, uh, and uh, after which uh, he uh, returned to India, uh, and uh, briefly at Math Science, but uh, then joined the Ramakrishna Mission, where he was for uh, several years uh, until I think maybe um, how long, seven or eight years ago, uh, you moved to uh, TIFR Mumbai. Uh, and uh, of course, through this whole period, we have always chatted about maths, physics, many things. Uh, and so it's especially a, a delight to have Mahan uh, with us for this occasion. Mahan has already also a number of uh, awards and accolades to his name for his fundamental researches in uh, uh, hyperbolic geometry. Uh, uh, so the um, Bhatnagar Award, the Infosys Award, and the various fellowships of academies uh, in, in, uh, in all the Indian academies, uh, etc. cetera. So, uh, uh, so that, uh, and now in the last several years, he has built a, uh, a very, a vibrant school of mathematics in uh, Mumbai, uh, uh, creating many new areas of mathematics in the country. Uh, and uh, so not only as a scientist, but as also as a, uh, through scientific leadership, he has been uh, doing a great job. So let me uh, invite Mahan uh, to uh, take us through dimensions one, two, three, four to infinity, I presume. But before that, there's a small memento uh, 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 for the occasion that I uh, want to present to Mahan for <laughs> agreeing to give this lecture. Yeah, so so, so thank, thank you very much for uh, this very kind introduction, Rajesh. Yeah, we are literally uh, yeah, what one would call chaddi buddies. So we, we, we wore shorts when we knew each other first. So, well, I mean, shorts when shorts was not a fashion statement. So, um, so thank you very much, Rajesh. And I think I was just Arriving here, one of the, the great things that one senses as soon as one arrives at ICTS is that, look, uh, I mean, all the other concerns, non-scientific concerns, are completely taken care of. I mean, it, one knows it's, these things are very hard to manage. And there is this extremely efficient system working uh, completely unobtrusively in ICTS. And that allows us. Uh, to do our science, and I think it's, it makes us scientists feel very grateful for that for that system in place. Okay, so uh, one other great thing about ICTS is that there are no departments. I mean, science is a is a is, a, is an integral thing. I mean, it's it's a it's an organic unity. So uh, and uh, I mean, I, I think uh, I'll have to really go back 
to the time when Rajesh and I really first met, because that's the limit of my knowledge of biology. And uh, uh, I mean, we, we'll start off with this thing, which I think we had learned in school, which says something like, uh, what was it? Ontogeny repeats phylogeny. I mean, this is something we learned in class eight, as far as I remember. And uh, this is this is where this talk starts. I mean, it's it's children's drawings, yeah, stick figures. And uh, what we are going to do is this is supposed to be one. Sticks are one dimension, right? So basically, little pieces of the interval, yeah. And so it's one dimensional objects assembled together in some sophisticated way. Uh, maybe not particularly sophisticated, but it's, it's really children's drawings that you should think of. And this is something that's repeated today, I mean, when, when people grow up. And uh, what about, I don't remember which one is which, which one is ontogeny, which one is phylogeny. But uh, if you, this is, this, is, this, is, this is actually something that's more than, it's, it's about a thousand years old. 700 years older than Euler, who is uh, who's going to figure in the talk. Uh, these are these drawings. These are called sand drawings, spelt that way. Yeah. So um, this is actually this is something that has come up. I mean, in 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 a very recent issue of the the Scientific American. Uh, what's the mathematics behind this? And so this is something that's historical. I mean, as as the species we belong to evolved. Uh, these were patterns, and today we have all these other things which, which all children do. And uh, there is a certain uh, structure behind this, which is what we'll be trying to probe. Um, and uh, this, I'd like to say, point this out, that UNESCO uh, relatively recently, I think 2008 or thereabouts, it has declared these sand drawings as, as part of this informal uh, oral and cultural heritage of, of our species. Um, okay, so, so, the, so one, one historical thing and the other something that's repeated today when, when people are growing up. But there's a, there's a lot of sophisticated structure behind these things, which we, which, I mean, we, 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 we start off this, uh, this whole thing by starting to, trying to ask ourselves, what's the common structure? How do we understand all these things that some people who probably uh, wouldn't even have heard the word topology or geometry uh, were doing. And children, without knowing that, they're actually doing this. And uh, yeah, another nod to biology. This is something that I learned from a mathematician who is interested in biology, Misha Gromov. Um, apparently, the part of the brain uh, that learns while playing when we are, we are kids is essentially the same part which is active when we are playing and trying to gain knowledge during research. So yeah, so, 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 so there's, there's, there's something there. So let's, let's try to use that same part of our minds trying to understand the structure behind these things. OK. Um, what's, what, what, I mean, how, how are we going to go about doing this? All right. So first, as is our want, I mean, when we when we draw these things on sand or when a child plays around, they are actually coming up with much more sophisticated things that, than what we as practicing mathematicians can deal with when we start. So let's remove some of this sophistication, get to something very simple. So you can, you can think of this as, well, uh, a figure made of matchsticks. So there's these red match heads and sticks. And then all there's, there's just one restriction that I'll impose here, that the sticks cannot cross themselves. So this is, this is really fast forwarding from this one or two uh, diagrams, 700 years maybe, roughly. And we'll, we'll get to something there. So, and the, the first thing that we want to do is, is, is there some hidden structure behind all this? So, so there are these three different kinds of objects that you see there. I mean, there are these red match heads, there are these black sticks, and there are these white regions in the middle. Is there some relation between, um, between these, these objects? I mean, between these blobs, sticks, and regions. So, so you, you just count them. I mean, let's, let's just take a count first. 
So if you count match heads, there are nine of them. There's four here, four at the next level, one in the middle. Sticks, that's four. And then there's eight, and there's four in the middle, so that's 16. And white regions are, well, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, that's eight. And um, again, another Russian mathematician, V.I. Arnold, um, he used to describe uh, mathematics as that branch of science where experiments are cheapest, right? So this is a fairly cheap experiment. You just draw it, count some things. And it turns out, you, after you play around with these objects, you look at this number, 9 minus 16 plus 8. It's a fairly simple number. It's just 1. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, a priori, you started off with something reasonably sophisticated, and you got this simple number 1. And then you try to make some more experiments. And so let's try another figure. So this is the one. This is, um, OK, so this is another figure where, again, there you have these match heads. The, uh, the black sticks don't intersect, and the regions, I have just been lazy and I have not co colored them white. But there are these regions inside. So if you look at the number of match heads, there's actually, uh, the, the right way to draw this is to draw these middle vertices a little inward. Yeah? So then, then basically there's five on one layer, five at the next, five at the next, and five in the middle. So there are four layers of five vertices each. Uh, so you have 20 vertices, or well, these match heads, I mean, mathematicians are very unromantic. So we remove all the, 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 the match heads and uh, all the play that was there, call them by this, uh, by this boring term, vertices. Well, let's call them vertices for now on, from now on. Um, let's call the sticks edges. And then you're going to see, well, and there's these five edges. And then, again, you count, and you, you, there are six layers of five edges each. So there's a 30 edges. And the number of regions is there's five here, five here, and one in the middle. So that's 5 and 5, 10, and 1, 11. So again, you perform the same experiment, and you get v minus e plus f equal to 1. So it's, again, the, the, the simplest number that you started off with. And uh, so then, I mean, one does this a few times, and then one starts noticing this pattern emerging. And uh, well, something is up. I mean, see, the, again, two parts of it. I mean, one of it is basically making this observation first. And then, then once you've seen this pattern, trying to prove that this is a, a very general pattern, so instead of taking these very specific, um, very regular objects, let's just take something off the shelf. So uh, having just come from Bombay, we just had decided to take the map of Bombay. So what is it? This is supposed to be Bombay divided into its subdivisions. Yeah. And corresponding to this, you can draw a similar graph where you have a vertex for each of these regions. Yeah. So there's north is a vertex, east is a vertex, west is a vertex, et cetera, et cetera. So there are seven regions. So there are now seven vertices. Uh, the color coding is insignificant. It's just to make sure that, I mean, if I had put red here, red would not be a nice contrast against purple. So that's also, don't look at the colors. Just think of these as vertices. And then you start drawing edges. So an edge is drawn between two of these vertices, if and only if these two regions share a boundary. Yeah. So that's, so basically, I'm just taking some, some map from some atlas out, putting it on paper. And then there's this formalism for drawing a graph a graph where the edges don't intersect each other. So you have vertices, and then you have draw, draw these things, and then forget where it came from. So then you have this picture. Yeah. So basically, you have 4 and 1, 5, and 2, 7 vertices. Edges are 1, 2, 3, 6, 8. Uh, did I miscount? 3, and 4, 7, and 2, 9. Yeah, 9. And there are faces, are, I mean, so this regions, which we call faces, 1, 2, and 3. So here. There's a thing for this also, for this map just taken off. Um, I mean, some generic map. Uh, get 7 minus 9 plus 3. And uh, you get the same numbers. It's, again, 1. And uh, again, it's, it's, there's no political bias. So you view, I mean, this is one of the great things. If, if, if in future this part of it goes under the sea, unfortunately, which seems to be a case, I mean, to be something that's possible. Or if it gets divided into further districts or various things coalesce together, independent of that, 
um, there's this apolitical conclusion, 7 minus 9 plus 3, this V minus E plus F is always going to be invariant. Okay, so there's nothing special about Mumbai. And actually, I think perhaps the easiest would be the map of US because their boundaries are fairly unimaginative, uh, verticals and horizontals. And so you can, you can count that and it's, it's fairly, fairly easy to prove that. That this, I mean, this V minus E plus F is always equal to one. So this is, this is dimension one. And it's called, this V minus E plus F equal to one, or a variant of it, is called Euler's formula. So that's, that's really where, in history, um, the field of, of mathematics, which we call topology today, really starts off. It's, it's, it's really basically one dimension in one-dimensional patterns in this flat uh, um, piece of paper that we can draw. So um, that's 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 the first thing. Okay. So now so this is supposed to be one, two, three, four, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's, so we've done with one for the time being. We'll use it. But now let's move on to dimension two, and ask ourselves. Well, it's it's not very hard to prove. Why? I mean, once you observe that this v minus e plus f is equal to one, then there's some standard cranking of the handle. I mean, it's it's really more about seeing what the pattern is, and once you've seen that pattern, it's, it's not very hard to prove. Okay, so now let's try to see if you move up one dimension, which means you're really looking at now two-dimensional patterns in three-dimensional space, do you have some such thing, something that remains unchanged, yeah? And uh, we'll start with something which is a fairly basic fact about Euclidean geometry. You take any convex polygon like this, and then you look at the exterior angles. You basically extend all the edges, look at the angles there. These are the ex external angles. Sum them up, and you're going to get 360 degrees, 2 pi. Yeah. That's our starting point. OK, fine, use that. And then ask, well, now from there, you should be able to deduce what the internal angles are for any regular polygon with n sides, yeah, with all sides equal, all angles equal. So those are, those, are, those are polygons which are called regular polygons. So what's, what's going to be the internal thing? Well, for, for three, an equilateral triangle, certainly we all know that the internal angles are 60 degrees, but let's try to use this to get the same thing. So there are three of these, three, I mean, the, the, there's a triangle has, has three, vertices, which means that the internal plus external at every vertex is 180. You sum over all the three, so you get three into 180. Remove the external, which is two into 180, that's what this says. And you're left with one into 180, which is the sum of the angles inside, right? So the equilateral triangle, the internal angle is one into 180 degrees. So each, 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 angle would be just this divided by three. It's just a very convoluted way of getting back at, at the fact that all the internal angles of an equilateral triangle are 60 degrees. But now let's, let's, let's go up. I mean, for, for an equilateral triangle, it's very trivial. For the square also, we know the, the same thing. So that's four, four vertices. Internal plus external at every vertex is 180. So the sum of all the angles, internal and external, over all the four vertices is four into 180. You throw away 2 into 180 for the outside. You're left with 2 into 180 inside. And you divide by 4, you get 90 degrees. Uh, first, well, slightly non-trivial is this pentagon, because this is not something we usually do all the time. So it's this is number 1, 2, 3. It's it basically number of vertices. And you remove 2 for the external guys. So that's this is 5 minus 2 is 3. And then you have 180, which is what we're multiplying that by and then divide by five, you get 108 degrees. And essentially, what you're going to get is that the interior angle for any polygon, which is regular, means all angles equal, or let's say all sides equal for now, is n minus two into 180, and then the whole thing has to be divided by n. So the whole of the sum is this, and you divide by n. As n becomes larger and larger, um, a curious thing is that this n minus 2 divided by n starts moving towards 1. So 
essentially, I mean, that's, that's supposed to be a suggestion that if you have, have regular polygons, then they are really going to converge to something that's like a circle. And basically, the internal angles are becoming 180 degrees or something smooth. All right, so this is all that we'll really use from Euclidean geometry and move on. And now, now let's, let's ask a basic question. Yeah, so in the, in the case of one dimensions, we had for, the, for this one dimensional topological problem, this graphs, et cetera, et cetera, we were ignoring internal features, but now we are going to introduce a local feature that we would like to investigate. And here's the basic question. So you have all these solids. They have, I mean, they, they, they come from a particular special class. They're called platonic solid. Basically, it means that all the vertices have the same number of edges coming out. All faces have the same number of edges around them. And uh, we ask ourselves, I mean, which, which one of these is sharpest? And, and what's the measure of sharpness? Well, um, there's, there's one crude way. Imagine, well, crude in imagination. Just pick up one of these and imagine poking yourself with it and which, which pains more. Yeah, so that's the that's measure of sharpness. That's it. And uh, so how are, we going to, how are we going to measure it? How are we going to assign a number? How are we going to assign a number? I mean, can we say that, okay, so if, if, if the amount of irritation annoyance that's caused is, can, can you assign a number to it? Yeah. And then basically, um, again, ignoring all the variations between people in terms of neuronal responses, et cetera, et cetera, all that we'll regard as irrelevant. Um, but how do, how, how do we measure this sharpness? And so then we'll basically have to ask ourselves, what is something that is not sharp at all? So essentially, let's, let's take this, this flat floor is something that has no sharpness about it. So that's our standard for, for so this we'll have to set a zero. Yeah, so the flat floor is, has no sharpness at any point. Okay, fine. So now let's look at any of these vertices. So this, this is a bunch of polygons around it. And you can measure angles of these polygons. These are polygons, so they are bona fide two-dimensional objects. So they have well-defined internal angles. Sum those angles around a vertex, and then if you, what would the sum be for a completely blunt object, for a completely flat object? That sum would be 360 degrees. And sum of the angles around a vertex is 360 degrees. So you just take the difference, yeah? And well, you can either take the sum of the angles and subtract 360, or you can take 360 and take off the sum of the angles. There is no real, I mean, between these two choices, there is really nothing. I mean, it, it's, you could do either. So it's a convention, really. And uh, so when this sum of the angles is, I mean, when this difference is positive, we just decide that, okay, we'll call that positive sharpness. And if it's, uh, if the sum of the angles is greater, we'll call it negative sharpness, okay? so. The sharpness has a mathematical term for it. It's called curvature, but we'll, we'll come to that later on, okay, if necessary. All right. So now let's, so, so now we have a very naive measure of sharpness called curvature by mathematicians at every point. So there's, a, there's some amount of sharpness localized at these finitely many vertices. If we look at a point inside one of these gadgets, it's going to be zero because it's like a flat plane. The same thing for these edges where, where you're folding. Why? Because the angle on one side is 180 degrees. The angle on the other side is also 180 degrees. So the edges also don't have curvature. So the curvature or the sharpness is really concentrated at finitely many points. Okay? Good. So here's, here's, here's the question. And uh, well, what is the total sharpness? That's, that's the kind of question that one would like to ask. Yeah? So basically, in the, in the graph thing, we really summed over all possible configurations. And that's the kind of question that we would like to address to start off with. So that, that's, that's something, that's the first experiment. So let's do this for a, for a regular tetrahedron. Yeah? That's one of those pictures. What is, what is the sharpness at each vertex? So it's a regular tetrahedron, and this, so each face, is, a, is an equilateral triangle. So the internal angle here for this triangle is 60 degrees. 
So now you have three of these faces coming together. What's the total angle, total sum of those angles? 60 plus 60 plus 60. That's total sum of the angles is 180 degrees. So the angle defect, recall, is the total, total angle at a vertex is 180. Sharpness at a vertex is, according to our convention, 360 minus 180, which is 180. Okay. So the total amount of sharpness at a vertex of a tetrahedron is 180. Good. What's the total sharpness? There are four vertices, some, on, some over that. You get four into 180. So there's 720 degrees of sharpness carried by this entire tetrahedron, which is four vertices. Fine. Let's move on. So this is one experiment. This time we'll do three experiments before we get something. OK, so now let's go to the cube. So here, each face is a square. So internal angle is 90 degrees. So sum of the angles around a vertex is 90, 90, 90. That's 270. Sharpness at a vertex is 360 minus 270 equal to 90, which is half of 180. So uh, as per this naive measure, you're supposed to, uh, it, a cube is supposed to pain you half as much as a tetrahedron is supposed to pain you when you, when you poke yourself with it. OK, since we are doing everything in imagination, doesn't matter. OK, so now uh, each, each vertex has, has this total amount of sharpness, 90 degrees carried by it. But how many vertices are there? There are four and four, eight. And total, therefore, the total sharpness is 8 into 90. Again, 720. Yeah. So the total sharpness carried by the, the cube is the same as the total sharpness um, carried by the by the tetrahedron. So if you poke yourself with all the vertices, you're going to experience the same amount of discomfort. OK, let's, let's move on to the, to the next example, the dodecahedron. This is, this, is the sum, this, is, this, is, this is actually related. I mean, this is the same thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically the, one of the graphs that we had drawn in when we were doing these matchstick figures. There are these five vertices. There's this face here and you move backward, and you put one face at the back. That's the only difference between this graph and the graph we had drawn earlier. So again, this one has each face pentagon. Each face is a regular pentagon. So each face is a regular pentagon. We'd calculated the internal angle. This is 180 degrees, uh, sorry, 108 degrees. And there are three faces to a vertex. So total angle at a vertex is 3 into 108, 324. So the sharpness at a vertex is 36 degrees. So it's, again, considerably less than the cube. Yeah. Um, total sharpness, well, there are 20 vertices. So again, it's 20 into 36, that's 720. Yeah. So yeah, so these are, these are experimental things. So basically, but we've just taken platonic objects. And this is something that really does have a, a universal existence. And uh, this is a fact. So this is something that was discovered by, by Gauss, and a proof was given for later on uh, by, by, by Bonnet for, for a somewhat more general situation, which we'll come to a little later. So you take any convex polyhedron. So we've done regular polyhedra. Yeah. So basically, all faces the same, et cetera, et cetera. Don't need regularity. It's, it's actually, uh, let, let me just tell you the proof for, for a tetrahedron, and you'll see that it's, it's, it's fairly easy. So tetrahedron has, has so we, we did uh, a measuring at each vertex. But suppose we don't know that. Well, then you, you, you're going to sum the angles at each. Let's, let's go back to the picture of a tetrahedron, and then let's just do this exercise. So suppose this tetrahedron is not regular. Yeah? So you're going to sum one, two, three, and then for all the vertices, all the vertices of the tetrahedron, which means basically you're going to sum the internal angles for each face. But there we know the sum. That's 180 degrees. So now instead of summing over all vertices, you first sum over all the faces. I mean, you, you, for, you sum the angles in each face and sum over all faces. So this is doing the usual combinatorial game of summing one and then summing the other. And that's, that's you get four into 180 degrees. That's the total sum of sharpnesses. You don't measure individual sharpnesses, but you can still measure the total sharpness. And then you're going to do the same thing, and the total sharpness is going to be um, 360 degrees, 4 into 360 degrees minus that. So that's still 4 into 180 degrees. Okay? 
So essentially, I mean, this thing that we did for a tetrahedron and regularity was an overkill, but essentially you can do this. And, and, and essentially that Euler's theorem, that V minus E plus F equal to one, you just put it, put it on very mild steroids and, and you can uh, really get, get, get this thing out of it. It's, it's, it's really a one dimensional theorem. So, we, so, so this gauss bonnet theorem, in its, this, is, this is called a polyhedral gauss bonnet theorem. Basically, you look at um, polyhedra, which are convex for convenience, and then you do this amount of measure this curvature or sharpness at every vertex, sum over all vertices, you're always going to get the 720 degrees. So this is for any convex polyhedron. Okay. All right. So um, now, at this stage, um, the two things that we want to do. First, I mean, this is something that could probably have been done um, way, way before, say, Newton or Leibniz. I mean, essentially, this is... This is the way Gauss actually came across this was uh, by doing calculus, by looking at surfaces and looking at curvatures at various points. It's an infinitesimal quantity. You really need to have calculus going on before that. But here it's a very naive version. You're just doing a count. Yeah? You, have, you have some finitely many vertices. You're counting, you're, you're computing curvature at various vertices. Summing over that, it's just some finite thing that you're doing. You don't need calculus. So basically there is this um, um, there is this, this, this polyhedral version which really makes the content of the gauss bonnet theorem very, very transparent. Yeah, it's, it's just something which is, it's really, if you want to break it down into pieces, you can assemble this polyhedron out of tetrahedra, and we've already proved it for tetrahedra. So that's it. I mean, so that's really basically a complete proof of the polyhedral gauss bonnet theorem. And now, um, um, well, let's try to be a little fancy. Uh, once Newton has made his advent, um, calculus has been introduced, you want to look at any um, smooth surface. Yeah? And then what you want to do is, is there a version of this? Well, yeah, sure. So basically what you want to do is you want to look at various convex polyhedra and Assume that they are sort of finer and finer and they are converging to some smooth object. For each of these, the sum of these, the, these uh, um, sharpnesses, some of these curvatures is going to be this invariant object. So, well, if you have a sensible way of passing to a limit, you're going to get the same thing. So, which means basically this amount of sharpness concentrated at a vertex, you want once you pass to a limit, you want an infinitesimal version of it. And essentially, from this finite sum, you can pass to an infinite sum. Riemann tells us that it's an integral. So the sum converges to an integral. And basically, you get the, the, the gauss bonnet theorem, um, which is basically, which says, essentially, that, that for something that looks, top, looks like the sphere, looks, looks like this uh, polyhedron, but without um, having well-defined uh, faces, uh, that there is a way of measuring something like curvature at a point, but it's an infinitesimal quantity which you need to now integrate rather than just sum, and you get back the same object. So it's, it's really the classical gauss bonnet theorem is really something where the, the, the conceptual foundations, I mean, there are two parts of it. One is this calculus part of it, which you can, I mean, that's, that's not the essential geometry of it. And then there's this, this fairly naive stuff which presumably Euclid could have done 200 years, uh, yeah, well, 2,000 years back or more, yeah. Okay, so, so that's fine. So this is for a polyhedron, yeah? Um, are there more general versions? So um, I think uh, at this point, I'll just make a, uh, an excursion to high dimensions and come back. And the uh, excursion to high dimensions is just going to be basically a little bit of, yeah, so this has been some mathematics, so I'll just narrate, I mean, tell you some stories now for one slide, and then we'll get back to maths. So this is the, this is the high dimensional excursion. So this V minus E plus F, yeah, this is this thing that we were calculating. Um, this now has a name. I'm sure it's, it's not given by Euler. It's called the Euler characteristic, yeah? So um, in higher dimensional objects, so basically if you have things which are built out of uh, 
say, so here, what were, we, what were we looking at? We had vertices, we had edges, we had faces. Yeah. So now you have a higher, say, four-dimensional object whose faces are now three-dimensional polyhedra. Yeah? So which means now you'll have vertices, edges, faces, and then polyhedra. Yeah? And again, so, so yeah, so zero-dimensional. Okay, so now let's call them zero-dimensional faces, one-dimensional faces, two-dimensional faces, and three-dimensional faces, or whatever you want to call them. Vertices and edges have, have much too specific connotations, but faces, well, it's still it's a little ambiguous. So we'll just call them zero minus one plus two minus three plus four minus five, et cetera, et cetera. So and then you can just go on, right? So that object is called the Euler characteristic, and it generalizes to all dimensions. Yeah? And uh, yeah, I mean, well, we don't, can't quite go to infinity because then there's all these problems, but finite, arbitrarily large. For all finite numbers. So this gadget has this name, it's called the Euler characteristic. And uh, so this is Gauss. And uh, I mean, I think when I was uh, uh, designing slides for this, basically this talk, I had no idea what Bonnet looked like. So I think that was a game. So this is what Bonnet looks like. And uh, this is, so this is, I think, um, yeah, so, so Gauss. Gauss was Riemann's, uh, yeah, basically thesis examiner. So this is uh, early 19th century. This is late 19th century. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's correct. So Euler was 18th century, yeah. 1700s. Uh, Gauss was yeah, early 19th, and Bonnet was later than that. And so, so, the, so the Euler's formula is one dimension finished in the 18th century. The two-dimensional object, this gauss bonnet theorem, is, uh, is 19th century. And so now, once you have this uh, higher dimensional objects, um, there's this person who comes somewhat in between, Gauss's student, Bernhard Riemann. And uh, in order to make sense of all this stuff about curvature in higher dimensions, et cetera, et cetera, and how to organize all that information together, you need Riemann. And then, then you have another person who will come appear on the last slide, and then these various things start playing together. And essentially, you have a version of this theorem, of this very simple theorem that we've talked about here, um, that we, I mean, the, there's, there's this Euler characteristic which remains unchanged, V minus E plus F. And you sum over that, you get something which is the 720 is the more fancy way of calling it. It's, ba it's basically 2 pi times 2, where 2 is the Euler characteristic of the sphere. See, of the, for the plane, it's just 1. That was this V minus E plus F equal to 1. But if you put a disk behind it, then you get a nice round sphere. That was this polyhedron that we were talking about. So you have one extra face. So you so in this formula V minus E plus F, you'll just have to add 1, 1, 1 to every, every equation. So you get 2. So basically, the, the fancier way of putting all this together is to say that 2 pi, which is 360, times the Euler characteristic, which is true for the sphere, is exactly equal to the sum or the integral of the curvature. That's, that's, that's basically the way it's said today. But this is, this is if you unpack that, that formula, this is what it means. OK, so. Um, so the, the thing is, if you try generalizing this to higher dimensions, um, this is done middle twentieth, middle of, middle of the twentieth century. And I saw, I think, yeah, this is um, definitely belonged to the previous century because I keep thinking of this as, as, as the time where, yeah, sort of grew up. So, so this this man here, his name gets added to this. Uh, I think this was around the nineteen fifties that Chern did this, and uh, I mean, since I'm supposed to. Tell some, and this is supposed to be a bit of a break from the map. Um, uh, yeah, so I, the, this is, uh, Chern was at, uh, was where I, I was, went to grad school, and uh, he had retired by then. Uh, in my final year in grad school, there was uh, the Chinese students on campus. They decided to dedicate a, a hall in Chern's name, and Chern is generally regarded as one of the fathers of 20th century geometry. And uh, they invited Chern to give the inaugural lecture. Chern was, uh, I think, in his mid-80s at that time. 
yeah, about 84, 85, 85. And uh, uh, he starts off with saying that, look, I have spent all my life thinking about Riemannian geometry. I should have spent more time thinking about it's now called Finsler geometry. What's that? Basically, in, 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 in Riemannian geometry, you have this space, let's say, let's say a surface at every point. You have vectors, so the angle makes sense, length makes sense. But in Finsler geometry, angles don't make sense, only length makes sense. And, and there are very natural examples that come up. Yeah? You can just measure lengths, but you can't say what is conformal, what, is, what are the right angles. Uh, he said that, look, this decided to pay some attention to this more general object which is which 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 was really coming up all over the place, and uh, at the age of eighty five, and uh, he delivered I think uh, a series of free lectures, and a few years later that became the foundational work in the area. So well, age is just a number. So that's that's yeah. Sometimes so this is actually part of it is also very. I mean, when Rajesh was saying that we, yeah, 40 years, I said, okay, wow, yeah, we really developed a lot of gray hair. So, okay, so, but, but this is this is very encouraging that, um, yeah, I mean, Churn at the age of 85 comes up with this, uh, this foundational piece of work. So there is a version of the gauss bonnet theorem. Uh, the point is, it really, I mean, the way Churn descri describes it, it really works for all even dimensions. Yeah? I mean, for odd dimension, there is a formula, but it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a trivial equation. It says zero equal to zero. Yeah. That's, that's not very illuminating. But uh, there are ways to work around that and get genuine statements in odd dimensions also. But uh, as, again, Gromov is fond of saying, uh, the number three has uh, two lives. It's either two plus one or it's four minus one. That's supposed to be a, a very enigmatic statement, and you keep poking him, and then finally basically says that, well, you have four dimensional geometries which have a different origin, very closely related to physics. And then if you, if you have the boundary of that, a four dimensional space time, let's say, that's three. So that's four minus one equal to three. If on the other hand, you look at it from this uh, classical geometric point of view, then you start off by uh, not having a space-time declared to you by, uh, by nature. You have a, you're basically trying to work up geometry. So basically the, you do it the way Euler and then, uh, well, yeah, Euler and then Gauss and then Riemann did it. So basically you first do dimension one, then dimension two, and then two plus one is three. And that's what, that's actually this particular talk is really going to be more about two plus one equal to three rather than four minus one equal to three. However, here, just this one place, this gauss bonnet theorem in all even dimensions has an odd dimensional version, which emphasizes this four minus one equal to three. Um, for, for, the, for the physicists in the audience, I mean, I think it's, that also has Chern's name in it. It's, it's Chern Simon's theory. Okay, um, fine. So, uh, yeah, so this is supposed to be a spiel. Um, I'm basically saying that look, uh, geometry is ubiquitous, yeah, of course. One has reached an age where one can advertise one's field without uh, shame. So uh, from children's sticks to these sand drawings, mathematical graphs, networks, polyhedra, very complex multidimensional shapes, the, the visual content of that, we, when we want to try to unify that field that decides it is geometry. All right, so with that, now let's try to look at the classical gauss bonnet theorem again. But now let's not look at something as boring as just a convex polyhedron. So this is a, a toral thing. This is a toral polyhedron. And here, so for the, for the convex polyhedron, the sum of all the vertices was 720 degrees. But how about other surfaces which are not convex polyhedra, but would still have polygonal faces? What about, how about this? So this is what's called a toral poly, 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 polyhedron. Uh, sorry, this is, a, this is a mistake. It should be a toral polyhedron. Um, so the, if, if you look at this, then you're going to get that the, if you look at the, some of the curvatures, some of the sharpnesses for this torus, you're going to get zero. It's fairly easy to do that. You take a cube, imagine a cube, and inside that just punch a square hole all the way through. So then you start measuring the angle defect at a vertex in the inside. So what's that? It's got these three sectors, X, Y, Z, where the positive sector has been thrown out. 
And inside that, you've drawn two guys, right? So, I mean, that's, I mean, there's, there's three things which give you 270 degrees on the top, and there are two things going inside. So there's 90 plus 90, 180 inside. So the curvature at one of these internal vertices, sorry if this is a little, I should have had a picture. Um, it's, it's like one of these gadgets here. Imagine one of these gadgets here. So it's 270 plus 180, which means basically five into pi by two, and you have to subtract it off from two pi. So the, the curvature concentrated at those vertices is minus pi by two. So this is an example where essentially it's basically just imagine a square piece of paper cut out a quadrant, and then imagine flipping that quadrant twice. Yeah? So that's, that's what you get, and you get curvature concentrated at that vertex is negative now. Yeah? now. How many such vertices are there? There are four on the top, four at the bottom. You're really going to subtract out what you had from the first time, you're going to get zero. Yeah? So essentially, so what I'm trying to say is that if you knew the, 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 the gauss bonnet theorem for a sphere, Generalizing it to these toral polyhedra, no big deal. Yeah? Essentially, you sit around, play with it for a while, you're going to get it. So for a toral polyhedron, this gauss bonnet theorem basically says you sum the curvatures, you're going to get zero. So which brings us to the question, what are all two-dimensional surfaces, two-dimensional polyhedra? Lo locally, things which look like the surface of, I mean, locally, something flat, yeah? built off just polyhedral, polygonal faces. And here are the first few objects we think about. This is the sphere, and now it's, it's tiled by these squares. This is a torus, and now you can put two of these guys together. I, draw, I mean, I was actually stealing all these pictures of the internet, so I didn't have a, I mean, I, people have not really drawn polygonal uh, genus two surfaces, but so there's zero, one, two of these handles, three of these handles for this guy. So this is again a 19th century theorem, basically says, that, well, I'm just going to say the words and then it's not too much. Any closed orientable surface is, well, forget this word if you like, if you don't like it. Um, it's like one of these spheres with G handles attached to it, yeah? So this one has, it's a sphere with G equal to zero handles attached to it. This is a sphere with one handle attached to it. This is a sphere in the middle, one here, one here. This is a sphere with one, two, three handles, and that's it, yeah? So essentially, you have to say something about what are the surfaces you're interested in. And that's this closed orientable surface. Again, this is something that's, that's taught in a, in a fairly basic course, and it's, it's, not, it's not very hard to prove. Again, proof is fairly combinatorial. And the general, I mean, this is where Bonnet comes in. The sum of the curvatures is 2 pi times the Euler characteristic, and here, the Euler characteristic turns out to be this V minus E plus F, which basically you just put vertices whichever way you like, so long as the faces are, are actually polygons. Then you're going to get this V minus E plus F is equal to two minus two times the number of handles that you attach. So this guy is two minus two G, yeah? For a G-handled object, is called the Euler characteristic. And the same Gauss bonnet, this is, this is the full Gauss bonnet theorem. The sum of the curvatures in a polygonal guy is two pi times the Euler characteristic, and there's an integral version of this. What is this, what is this really saying? It says that there is this, there's this very soft object, number of handles you're attaching, yeah? which really does not have anything to do with local phenomena. At each vertex, when you're looking at sharpness, you're measuring something which is local. This is the field of geometry. And when you're really allowed to smear things around when you're not interested in the local structure, broadly, that's what is called topology. Yeah? What this gauss bonnet theorem basically says is that you look at local phenomena, average it out, which means basically integrate it out or sum over various things. And what you get out of, out of it is something which is which does not care about local phenomena at all and is unchanged. Yeah? So that's, that's basically, I mean, the way, if you, if you really want to have a I mean, take home from this, it's basically the average of geometry is topology. That's what the gauss bonnet theorem basically says. That's, that's really it. I mean, and, and, and that does not care what the local specific geometry is about, yeah? Okay. So that's, that's classification of closed surfaces. But 
What did we have to do for this? We started off by having this full topological classification, and then we started looking at the geometry of things. Yeah? And then we found that, well, yeah, that's fine, good. You have all this very nice, very complicated, sophisticated kinds of geometry, but you average it out, you get something that's, well, it's just a list, zero, one, two, three, four, it's the simplest list that you can think of. But that's a classification, right? I mean, this is this statement here, this is a classification statement. Apart from this, there's nothing, nothing that exists in this, in this universe. Well, then mathematicians started getting greedy. Yeah, well, fine. First, let's see, okay, fine. You have two minus two G. I mean, this is really trying to ask, well, what, what about the best possible geometry that you can find? I mean, these, these polygons, there's nothing canonical about them. So two minus two G for G equal to zero is greater than zero, that's the sphere. For the torus, it's two minus two into one, one handle, that's zero. For everything else, it's negative. So what, what about the best metric? What would be the best metric? The best metric would be the most democratic metric, which means all points are given the same kind of respect. So which means you start with a poly polyhedral metric where you have curvature concentrated at finitely many points. You can think of that as a finite sum of Dirac masses of curvature or well, curvature weight. And then you start with some polyhedral metric like that and then try to smear that metric out till every point receives essentially the same kind of uh, weightage, infinitesimally. And here's, so this is, this is, this has a name. There's a way of making this formal and it's called Ricci flow. And relatively recently, I mean, this is a proof, which is, which is a now a 21st century proof. Um, maybe it was known before, but Ricci flow was not something that was a thing back then. And uh, you can essentially start with any object like this, with any metric you like, wherever. I mean, the worst part, worst metrics are the polyhedral guys. And you start smearing the curvature and you're going to converge to something where the curvature is constant everywhere. So basically you start with a knobbly little lemon like this and you run Ricci flow on it and you get to this nice, round, smooth metric. And this is a version of what uh, I've been told. Uh, yeah, this is. I'm trying to exhibit erudition I don't possess. So um, uh, this is, it's, it's called RG flow in, in yeah, well, in, in the very limited thing that I do understand, it's, it is exactly what, what this Ricci flow is. Okay, all right. So now, uh, so what do we have? So essentially in two dimensions, you have a full classification topologically and you have really the best candidates for the metrics. I mean, where basically you look at some point and you look at any other point, they look the same. Okay, fine. So then, then I think this is, this is still something, I mean, the, the classical proof of all this really goes back to the, to the, end, of the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. Yeah? Um, basically Poincare. I mean, not, not the Ricci flow, but, but, but there's, a, there's a different version of this. Okay, so this is, it's called the uniformization theorem. It's a Poincare, Cuebe, Klein uh, uniformization theorem, which basically says that every closed orientable two manifold, which is one of these surfaces, it admits a metric where the curvature is constant, which means everywhere it looks the same. Plus one for the sphere, zero for the torus, minus one for everything, which has more than one handle associated with it. At that point, at that point, this is early 20th century. People got really greedy. Yeah. So they said, okay, fine. We, we classified two, then we should be able to classify everything, right? So, so here's, here's the so now that was the question in, in great generality. So this is one and two done. Now let's two, do three, four, and well, however much we can. So this was the topology. Can we classify? Here's this simple number zero, one, two, three, which marks out all surfaces. What's the classification for all closed orientable three manifolds? What's the classification for all closed orientable four manifolds? Five, six, et cetera, et cetera. That's the topological problem. Can we classify them completely? Do we understand them? I mean, there's, there's, there, are there these well-defined dockets in which we can put all of them? That's the problem of topology. And then what are the best metrics on them? What would be the most homogeneous, um, sensible, best behaved metrics on these objects? And this, this is a problem that could certainly have been posed at, at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, yeah, so this is, I mean, the first thing is this is a sort of a 
you run into a yeah, completely um, insurmountable obstacle. Once you exceed dimensions, exceed dimension three, yeah? so dimensions four and above, um, in a very, very precise sense, which I'll elaborate on in a moment, no classification result is possible. Yeah. I mean, so what, what does that mean? Yeah, I mean, basically that, that any attempt to answer that question, it's a theorem that any attempt to answer that question is doomed to complete failure, complete unmitigated failure. So, I mean, uh, unless there's an oracle which tells you, you look at this very little small part of the domain. So what does it mean? So here's the thing. So now we, we, we change gears slightly. This is an excursion in higher dimensions. Don't, don't, I mean, it's, it's just something for culture, really. But, but every uh, mathematical talk should at least have, pretend to have one proof. So I'll, I'll, I'll pretend to give a proof here, okay? So uh, here's the thing. Essentially, you look at the class of some, something, you bring out something from the hat in some sense, you look at any, any group, any finitely presented group, which means what? You're really looking at finitely many generators and you're looking at words that you can generate and you declare that some finitely many words, R1, R2, RS, are actually trivial. So basically, the, these are what are called finitely presented groups. That's finitely many generators and finitely many relators. And it's a fact that you, this is a two-dimensional object. You have one, you have this n loops at a point, yeah? and then these relators are little disks whose boundaries are marked by these generators, which you just map in and attach to this object. So it's a, it's a two-dimensional object, not a manifold. Yeah? I mean, the, it's built out of one dimension and two-dimensional two objects. So this is called a complex. Now, here's the point. If you try to do this in three dimensions, it's, again, I mean, it's typically you won't be able to embed this object here. But here's a fact. Again, this is, this is a fact which is basically due to Whitney, and this is really mid-20th century or early to mid-20th century, around 40s. You can look at the, you, you can embed it without any intersections. I mean, so you remember the, in the planar graph, the edges were not supposed to intersect. Here, you're not allowed to intersect two of these faces. So you, in order to do that, in order to make sure that these guys embed in some space without crashing into each other, you have to take the dimension sufficiently large, n greater than or equal to five. This innocuous restriction is responsible for the negative answer to this question. So you look at n greater than or equal to five, embed this complex, and you thicken, you thicken this complex up, and then you look at the boundary of that object. That's a manifold, and that manifold has, turns out it has this group as its fundamental group, which means if you could classify all manifolds, you would be able to classify these algebraic gadgets. And then, okay, fine, so you've, you've removed structure, you've thrown away all the continuum, you've reduced to some very discrete combinatorial gadget called a group. And then you make it even more discrete by appealing to Turing. So Turing has this theory of computability and basically says that, <coughs> If you could solve this classification problem for groups, you would solve the halting problem. Yeah, it's basically says so Turing has this very naive way of saying, what is a computer supposed to do? Yeah? So basically, okay, so this is drawing from some, I don't want to get into the formal, formal uh, thing there. It basically says that you would be able to, uh, you can feed, there would be an algorithm to say whenever, whether you, if you feed, it would take as input any algorithm and would output whether that algorithm stops or is successful or not, yeah? And that's supposed to be, I mean, essentially the paradigm which says, this is what decides whether something is computable or not. So something is solvable or not in a fairly formal, precise sense. And so basically from this, after throwing out all the sophisticated structure, you still get a kernel problem which is not solvable, yeah? So there's no hope of even approaching the soft topological problem in dimension strictly greater than three. I think I am a couple of minutes already over time and I'm pretty close to the finish. So the last hope is dimension three. That's the last frontier and we're asking whether, well, if you try classifying and then it's, uh, again, it's, it becomes this completely weird setup. I mean, it's, it's I mean, the, the, the the classification of species is uh, generally pales into contemptible insignificance compared to this problem. I mean, you probe somewhere 
and you get all these weird structures. So this is again a problem that was there at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, well, I mean, people, so that was the last thing. I mean, can you classify three manifolds? That's the maximum we can hope for. And the answer to that is yes. We don't have a list, but it's in principle classifiable in the same sense that of this Turing thing. So this is Poincaré. He basically initiated the study of three manifolds. And there was a basic problem that one had to address called the Poincaré conjecture, formulated early, very early 20th century, first decade of the 20th century. And then this was essentially extended to all three manifolds by this man here. This is late 20th century, basically 1982. And then essentially the, 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 the way it was solved is not by looking at getting a topological classification, but by saying that you start with any topological three manifold that you have, you have a best metric possible. This was the conjecture of Thurston. This was proved by this man here, Perelman, and, well, officially in 2004, thereabouts. Yeah. So the, the solution is possible, but it goes by addressing the harder problem first, by getting the best metric, and then saying, run, do some of this, this, this hocus pocus, and generally say, okay, fine. Once you have this best metric, then you have this classification result because it's all decided by these finitely many objects where you have an algorithm to decide. So, um, so that's so, so the 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 final answer is hopeful that well, it's in dimension three, the last frontier has been taken. So now let's well find one. Once we've crossed the last frontier, the frontier has receded. So um, and so, so here we really want to ask now, I mean, and this is, I think Rajesh had asked me to uh, say a couple of words about uh, what's left. And essentially, once you've got the basic classification, now there are various other sophisticated kind of geometries that are possible. And uh, this problem here is, I mean, this, this uh, collage here is supposed to indicate, I mean, how do you relate these various different kinds of geometric structures that arise in three? four minus one, two plus one, and maybe there are some, some various other sources of, of geometric structures in three dimensions. How do they relate to each other? So that's, that's thank you. Yeah. Thanks uh, very much, Mohan, for taking us on this uh, uh, journey from uh, uh, from the line to uh, these uh, higher and, and wilder uh, geometries and spaces. Uh, uh, I'm sure Mahan would be happy to take questions. So uh, if you have any questions, please uh, put up your hand and uh, wait for the mic. Yeah, Herbert. Uh, thank you very much for a inspiring talk. I mean, I have a very naive question. I mean, uh, which is uh, about this uh, classification in, in higher dimensions. I mean, uh, okay, it's a Turing machine, but couldn't be, you know, some extremely clever mathematician just by some ingenious insights find the classification or is that sort of... Rule no, so, so, so if, if somebody did, I mean, I, I think that's the point that... that one would solve the halting problem. And the halting problem, I mean, basically, if one could prove the halting problem, then one would violate the paradigm of computability. So it's, I, I'm not saying that one would not get a classification, but would, one, one would not get a classification in the sense that we know the meaning of the word classification today. So by, by which one would have this, some kind uh, of uh, enumerative way. Uh, an enumerative uh, list and an algorithm which says that, okay, so you give me anything with some finite amount of data, then you run that algorithm, it will tell you which member of that list it is. So that's, uh, yeah. In that formal sense, it's not possible. Yeah. However, I mean, I, I mean, computer scientists have a way around that. So they bring in this notion of an oracle. Basically, a guy comes when you, somebody tells you that, look, this, you just have to ignore all this other stuff. It belongs to this very limited class of objects, not everything, yeah. And then once that is there, then you can really try, yeah. So once an oracle has told you that, look, this belongs to some special class, then you can actually try your hand there. And there, there, are, there are some, some, some of those classes have been classified, some have not been classified. Thanks, Ben. Hi, Mahan. Great talk, here. 
yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't quite understand uh, the connection between the solution of the Poincare conjecture yeah. and the classification of three manifolds. Ah, okay. Okay, very good. So, so what's the, so how does the, 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 I mean, how does, you're basically asking me, uh, uh, what is what is Perelman's proof of the bunker? Okay. So I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you in in a in a in a complete cartoon. Yeah. So what what Perelman does? He takes this Ricci flow, he runs it on something that is very coarsely, I mean, homotopically a three-dimensional sphere, and he does not get at the topology. He runs it and arrives at a beautiful round metric. And once you have a round metric, the topology is trivial. So, so basically, if you have something which has this soft information, very soft information of the fundamental group, what Perelman gives you is a way of circumventing all the flesh of the topology and then getting into this rigid geometric structure straight. It's very hard work, but that's what, that's what he does. Yeah, that's, that's what the RG flow is in, in dimension three. So you get at these canonical objects. Now, um, there was, there is a, so the, the, the metric does not quite behave very well everywhere. It does start throwing up singularities. It basically protests and starts saying that, look, you're trying to fit, uh, and sometimes, sometimes it says you're trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. And when you have that, the, the curvature basically starts becoming singular. But this was per Perlman's great contribution that this curvature blows up along very localized two-dimensional objects. So that's the sense in which two plus one is equal to three. So what you do is you cut along those two-dimensional objects. So you cut your manifold into pieces along basically surfaces. Yeah? And the surface is also very controlled. You cut them along spheres, you cut them along tori. You don't have to bother about high-dimensional surfaces. So there's just two of these kinds of cuts. And then you run your Ricci flow again, and then there are finite, I mean, what, what Perelman proves is that you just have to do this finitely many times, and then each of the pieces of the decomposition does have, a, have one of the eight, there are, in dimension two, there are three. Here, there are eight, basically, and, and what, it just fits into one of these eight. So, so once you have that, then you really have this, basically all three manifolds are assembled out of pieces, each of which has a canonical geometry coming from eight categories. And each of those are classified. So, uh, well, okay, there's a question there. Uh, so why is genus not a, like why can you not classify three manifolds with genus? Is there a counter example? No, you, 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 I mean, so it's, see, the thing is in, in dimension three, genus doesn't quite make sense. So genus makes, genus is basically the number of handle, handles that you've attached to a space. So that's, that's two dimensions. I mean, that's a two dimensional entity. In three dimension, the invariants are much more sophisticated. That was the point of this, uh, this previous picture that it looks like, a, like having, well, like one of those uh, classification of animal kingdom things. I mean, it's, each person gives you a classification scheme and then that's that sort of thing. But as a, as, a, as a formal fact, you can solve the classification problem. Basically, if somebody gives you a, a three manifold one and another man, three manifold two, you have an algorithm which tells you whether they are the same object or not. This is not about genus. It's, it's about essentially, I mean, so for example, here's, here's a very, Here's a very rich way of describing three manifolds. So you take this three-dimensional space and you assume there's one more point at infinity. That's supposed to be this three-dimensional sphere, x square plus y square plus z square plus w square equal to one. Yeah? Inside this, you draw some knot you like, any knot, yeah? which means basically you have, you have, you take a string, go all over the place and just splice the beginning and the end together. Yeah? Now you throw that guy out. For every knot you're going to have now a three manifold. Okay. So which means if you have a classification of three manifolds, you would have classified how many ways you can tie your shoelaces, assuming that you have endless amount of elasticity in your shoelaces. Yeah. Uh, so okay, it's not really about genes. It's 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 more sophisticated. 
Yeah, so I just wanted to understand this Ricci flow. So it looked like it's some dynamics of the surface which takes you from some arbitrary yes. uh, distribution of curvature to the uniform curvature. Exactly. Rate. But exactly. uh, I mean, I can imagine like I can have lots of different dynamics which does that. What's special about the Ricci? So the, what, what Ricci does, okay, here's the thing. I mean, why does it work in dimension two? In dimension two, there's just one curvature, which is the Gauss curvature. I mean, at take any point, you take the, I mean, take the, a circle, I mean, the, the tangent plane has two principal directions, one which, which curve most, yeah? And you look at the product of the radii of curvature, that's your curvature at a point. That's the same thing as Ricci curvature in dimension two. So what this is doing, what the Ricci flow does, is basically it forces, it wants to take curvature concentrated at a point and distribute it. It's something like a harmonic function, like a heat flow, but it's, a heat flow in terms of, the heat flow is a scalar object, right? So it, you're run, trying to run a heat flow, but with a tensor, which is, which is given by this curvature matrix. That's roughly what this, uh, so it's, it's, it's a difficult, uh, I mean, essentially you want to have, um, I mean, curvature in different directions becoming the same, which means you really have to take care of a, of a N choose two terms. I mean, so that's all of these guys you want to homogenize in something in a neighborhood. The scalar version of that is just, just heat flow. Yeah. yeah, it's a diffusion in the yes. metric. Uh, you take the time derivative of the metric, and that is like the Ricci exactly. uh, curvature, which is essentially the second derivative of the metric, the spatial derivative. So it's like one derivative of, and then you look at how the metric evolves. So it's with locally that. trying to kind of make locally, it. locally you're trying to kind of flatten it out or whatever. Yeah. You're homogenize to, it. Homogenize actually. it. I mean, uh, that's the, the, metric. I mean, yeah. the point is that, I mean, it's not that all the curvatures in all the directions will be the same. I mean, these standard geometries, and this is one thing that's more sophisticated in dimension three. There are geometries. So for example, you could take the sphere and then, which is curvature one. And let's take a product with the real line. So in some directions, it's flat. In some directions, it's plus, right? So it's you can't quite make a homogenization of the full curvature for this, right? So you have to take care of all this. And really, I mean, uh, unless you have extra structure, if you wanted to run it over all manifolds, three is the last dimension you can do it. I mean, where the Ricci actually captures the, the, all the curvature information. If you want to go to dimension four, you'll have to look at specific uh, kinds of metrics, but uh, not not all possible run in metrics. And if you run Ricci flow, you can run Ricci flow in dimension four. But uh, unless you have restrictions given by an oracle, you will not be able to get at a nicely behaved metric at the end. So there was a question online. I will just come to that. Uh, there was a question online by someone called David Brown. Uh, he asks uh, whether uh, uh, string theory would help in uh, uh, understanding geometry in a more generalized geometry and topology. And he was calling it, uh, uh, he had some name for it. But, uh, but essentially, that was the question. Uh -huh. And in fact, I was going to ask you, because in string theory, Topology is not necessarily an invariant way of uh, viewing a uh, space time. So it, it may be the classification problem, which is so difficult with the classical notion of topology might become uh, when, when you consider certain objects, which you might have firstly thought of as topologically distinct, yeah. but are equivalent in terms of a more general understanding. Uh, perhaps Fair it enough. becomes a tamer. The... Yeah. So, so here's, here's, okay. So I, I, I mean, okay, let me uh, try to break that down to something that I actually understand. <laughs> so, so if you want to say run, uh, I mean, let's say two dimensional surfaces and then um, say, so, so the, the, the mathematical version of this softer classification what are called cobordisms, which is, I think, what feeds into topological quantum field theories. And there, the classification is much easier. So three manifolds, I mean, here's the point. I mean, there's all this difficulty about classifying three manifolds. I mean, it all depends on when are you saying two guys are the same, right? Yeah. So, I mean, there's no reason why we should say that two guys are the same if they're topologically homomorphic. Well, that's, that was the convention. I mean, that's, that's what defines topology as a field. But René Thom, 
came up with this notion of a cobordism, which basically says that two manifolds of the same dimension are cobordant. Um, if there's a one higher dimensional manifold, whose boundaries these guys are. So, I mean, if I understand right, I mean, it's, uh, there are three theories on the two sides and you will have something in the middle interpolating between. And uh, in dimension three, uh, this, it turns out, I mean, once you've fixed orientation or fixed that the, all the guys are, are, are orientable, then it's a, it's a very simple classification. It consists of a single point. All, all three manifolds, orientable three manifolds are cobordered. In dimension four, it does, you do have that. And so in this softer way of cobordism, you have, you do have classification in all possible dimensions. This was actually, yeah, this is, okay, so this is really up to infinity. I mean, this is, this is really uh, 50s where, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it turns out to be a, a very algebraic classification and very abelian theory, yeah. Yeah, so uh, right. you say thing, something about the three dimension key. Uh, so is it because that uh, the Riemann tensor in 3D, yeah. it's like we can sort of know everything about it if we just know the DG scalar and the DG tensor. Essentially, that's the point. I mean, it's, it's an algebraic thing. I mean, there are, isn't enough, um, I mean, once you take the various averages, basically tells you what the sectional curvatures are. I mean, sectional curvatures means at all possible choices of two plates. Yeah, that's basically saying what the whole geometry is at a point. Yeah. And I mean, essentially saying that the curvature is two dimensional is, is where it starts off with. And then you are looking at all possible choices of two dimensions in arbitrary dimensions. That's the Riemann curvature tensor. In dimension three, you have this. I mean, this, this is this very happy situation where basically if you look at various averages, which is what this Ricci is about, you can extract information about the whole thing. And in dimension four and higher, the main problem is that there's a wild tensor, which is that because of that? Uh, there's everything. I mean, it, it's it's not just the veil tensor. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's not just the veil tensor. Yeah. Thank you. The last question, then. Uh, you mentioned about the Finzer manifold here. Yeah, here, yeah. 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 Uh, where you can only measure length but not angles. Yeah. Is there a real world object around us which has a Finzler manifold? Yeah. Can you? Well, it depends okay. on what you call real. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, for mathematicians only, it's a very real. No. So, so, two, I mean, it's two real. So, anyway, never mind. Okay. Never mind. Let's, okay. let's not go. <laughs> so, uh, what, about, what, what about those surfaces? Those two dimensional surfaces with perfect yeah. metrics, yeah? Uh, we can measure yeah. angles, right? So we can measure. But now you look at the space of all those two dimensional objects which have the best metrics. Okay. Yeah. So basically, there's a parameter par parameterization space for that. Right. Okay. And the, there's a very natural model for that where the metric, I mean, where the metric for that does not have a notion of angles. I mean, there are there is a there is a notion where you have angles, but that's not very useful. The one where you don't have angles is actually the the right way of measuring distances. Suppose you have two of these two-dimensional manifolds, let's say, of the same genus, genus two. Yeah. Okay. And one is a constant curvature metric minus one, and the other is also a constant curvature metric minus one. And you want to say how close they are to each other. How I mean, these, you run this Ricci flow, you you converge to something, but you don't know it could be a fairly large parameters worth of things. How are you going to measure distances between them? When are you going to say that two of these objects are close, two of these objects are far? And then you really have to come up with, and the right notion is, uh, is a Finsler metric. So basically, if you want, I mean, I'll just throw these words at you. It's, it's not very important. But basically, moduli problems very often give rise to Finsler metrics, yeah, which are not Riemann metrics. Okay. Thank you. And Okay, uh, thanks. I think we have to uh, close now because the stage also needs to be prepared and uh, uh, Mahan will be here You and we'll have a short break. You can please approach him and talk to him. Uh, we'll have, uh, we'll come back here at six o'clock for the cultural program and then there will be the dinner afterwards to which of course all of you are also invited. So let's thank Mahan again for a wonderful talk. Uh, yeah, and thank you very much for the questions. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, terrific. Yeah.